Good afternoon. It's hard to know where to begin in introducing our friend and Li Ka-shing distinguished visiting professor, Robert Clickgard. I could note the various positions that he's held at uh, universities, including uh, Dean of the Pardee Rand Graduate School and President of Claremont Graduate University, where he continues to serve as university professor. And I could note that he is one of these extraordinary individuals who are literally at the top in the world in a particular field, in the case of Bob, uh, anti-corruption policy making and program design. And yet, out of an innate curiosity that drives him, continues to explore and produce outstanding work in other cognate fields. I'd also like to note that he is himself a model of what he is speaking of today, high impact policy analysis, continuously serving as an advisor to presidents, prime ministers, and entire cabinets around the world in the process going well beyond dispensing standard cut and paste consultant style advice to a much deeper engagement. Despite being in high demand for these assignments from around the world, he has for two years running now uh, found time to spend two months plus with us here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And I know that I and my colleagues, as well as the students of the school, have benefited enormously from our interactions and engagement with Bob. In fact, I'll just close this introduction uh, by sharing with you something that might not be as apparent from listening to a lecture. And that is that in addition to being smart and savvy, Professor Clickgard is one of the nicest, most generous uh, individuals I've ever met. And I think you'll agree that that is a truly high impact combination that you don't see every day. I could, and in fact, I want to go on, but without further ado and adulation, very much earned, I will turn over the floor to Professor Robert Clickgard. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. How much do I owe you? This must be a small side payment. So um, how many MPP students are here? This is after a whole week of orientation. And you don't have anything better to do with your Friday evenings than this. How many MPA students are here? OK, you guys have been working hard, too. And MPM? They know better. They know better. <laughs> how many faculty members are here? Have you been reoriented this week by these students? Right. So those of you who are neither students nor faculty may know that the MPP students have been going through a week of orientation where they get pummeled, beaten, derided, lectured at, inspired in various combinations. Don't cheat. Do good work. Uh, and this is Friday. They should be down at the waterfront doing something. But after, after all, they were there last night. I saw them there last night. Right? You were, I saw you there, Yang. Yeah, I saw you there. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about what they've been imbibing and what they're going to be doing for the next two years, which is policy analysis. Policy analysis, in the words of Aaron Wildovsky, is speaking truth to power. Aaron, this is a book of his from 1979, which is the art and craft of policy analysis. And what he meant was addressing a standard paradigm, if you will, which is this. There is a decision maker faced with a choice who needs evidence on how to make that choice. And so the evidence must come from analysis. It must not just come from ideology or from political considerations or even from some moral command. Obviously, those are also important. But extending the reach of reason to bring more and more evidence to bear on important decisions is what policy analysis is supposed to be doing. Here's an example of the fad we have right now around the world of evidence-based this and that. One of the key ones is evidence-based medicine, also known as evidence-based practice. Two of the leading websites in the world are there for you to look at. One of them is at Oxford and one of them is in the US government. The one in the US government, in turn, has links to dozens 
of evidence-based practice centers on various aspects of healthcare and service provision. There's also evidence-based management. There's a nice website on the left and an okay book on the right. But notice it says profiting from evidence-based management. So they think it's worth money. Then there's evidence-based anti-corruption. I'll be going to this conference, eager to see what kind of evidence they have. There's evidence-based sports medicine for people like Scott who are climbing rocks and doing things like this. There's also evidence-based dentistry, evidence-based drug resist, uh, drug, uh, anti-drug policies, evidence-based this, 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 and this, and this. Now, what does it mean to get evidence? How do, you, how do you get evidence about complicated things like public policy? Well, you need some tools. First of all, you need to have some way to understand the very complicated systems in which social policy takes place. There are buffeting forces, there are whole lots of variables, and it's complicated. So we have fields like systems analysis and operations research and exploratory modeling and simulations which create models from which you can begin to deduce if I do this, this might happen over there. There are also social experiments and randomized clinical trials which try to randomize across variables that we know make a difference for an outcome so you can tease out what the effects of the treatment is or the medicine is or the practice is on the outcome. If you can't do a social experiment, which is awful, uh, which is often, you can also then try to use statistical techniques ex post to adjust for the many covariates that are operating besides the variable you care about. Econometrics is a well-known uh, set of tools which the students here are going to be mastering as they move through their careers. There's also implementation analysis where you look at the organizations through which real change takes place and, asks, and ask, apart from the theory about how things work, how might it work in practice? So for example, if you have a pilot project on a model farm and you ask, but if I want to move that to real farms by real peasants in this country, that's an implementation problem, which isn't the same of what works on the model farm. A very well-funded hospital project with the state-of-the-art people doing the, doing the hospital operation, when that moves out to the countryside, even in advanced countries, the difference in the outcome rates may be significant. So you have to understand the systems through which the actual competence, the incentives, the behavior of real organizations and how that affects it. And then your old friends, politics and policy process also matter in terms of what will happen when you try to do something. And indeed, if you give advice to do something, will it happen at all? Now, if you take the sum of these particular skills, you have to admit it's a pretty impressive group of skills, isn't it? It goes beyond economics or statistics or operations research or political science or public administration. In fact, we call this field policy analysis and its close relative evaluation. And this is what the students in this room will be imbibing here along with management and leadership and ethics during their time getting degrees at LKY school. And this is the field that Will Dosky was talking about and the field that I'll be talking about today. Now the interesting thing about this field is that we have great calls for needing to know what works. At the same time, when we get the evidence about what works, people don't pay attention to it. I need X, here's X. I don't want X. What kind of X is that? So let's take a look at some of the calls here. I've got a few nice quotes. Maybe we'll turn this microphone off so I don't get the feedback when I come over here. Okay, I'll just leave it over there. So um, take a look at an example of spending, huge amounts of spending going on, huge amounts of spending on evaluations going on, and yet the claim is that we're not learning enough. You've probably seen this in development circles. I'll just read you one of many I could give you. Successful programs to improve health, literacy, and learning, and household economic conditions are an essential part of global progress. Yet after decades in which development agencies have dispersed millions and billions of dollars for social programs, and developing country governments have themselves spent billions of dollars more, it is deeply disappointing to recognize that we know relatively little about the net impact of most of these programs. Addressing this gap and systematically building evidence about what works in social development would make it possible to improve the effectiveness of domestic spending 
and development assistance by bringing vital knowledge to the service of policymaking and program design. Okay? Now that's a call to arms, isn't it? To know more about what happens here. But he pointed out we've been spending billions of dollars already. And there are huge evaluation offices at the World Bank and USAID and the European community and DFID. And most countries have evaluation and policy programs within their own ministries. So if it's such a good idea to learn this stuff, why haven't they been learning it? Here's another example from Healthcare in America. This is from a 2009 review. Legislators and their scientific beneficiaries express growing concerns that the fruits of their investment in health research are not reaching the public, policymakers, and practitioners with evidence-based practices. Practitioners and public lament the lack of relevance and fit of the evidence that does reach them and barriers to their implementation of it. In other words, sometimes the studies get there. Here's all this knowledge, and they look at it, and it's not what I need. It's not what I want. There's a mismatch between supply and demand. So we have examples from development and health. But here's the point that really galls you. For at least 25 years now, at least 25 years, we have known in this field of policy analysis and evaluation that there are few good examples of the research we do making a difference. So here's Carol Weiss in a, a very prophetic piece of, uh, piece of writing, summarized this way. Occasional studies have direct effect on decisions, but usually at the relatively low level, narrow gauge decisions. Most studies appear to come and go without leaving any discernible mark on the direction or substance of policy. Now, if any of you want to shed a tear now, we won't, we won't get you. Now, here's a question I'm going to ask for your participation now. I promise I won't call on any of you students, but I'd like you to raise your hands and tell me this. If you look at these studies, policy research on the shelf with cobwebs, why? What's your hypothesis, or what is an hypothesis, about why this sorry situation might occur? Yes? Too much information. We've got so many studies that the only place, the only people that like them are the spiders, apparently. OK, yes? So the decision maker needs to decide now, but the study is three years old, and the world has already changed. We need a? We need a cleaner to clean the webs. We need to get those webs out of there. Would you, would you like, I've got something for you after, after the <laughs> seminar to put you to work. Over here. Done is not in line with what's actually needed. Maybe there's a mismatch. Okay, so there's two things she said. One of them is that professors don't write well. <laughs> what a bunch of rubbish. Professors, <laughs> shall we score her now? You mean professional journals aren't paragons of clear writing? No? And do you think there's a mismatch between the professional journal, what that gets, and what the policymaker gets? Possibly. Yeah. One person noted that the profession, especially has taken health policy where you have clinical trials. They like internal validity, the tightness of the study, the choice of that sample and that set of instructions for those patients. You can't deny that there was double blind this and it was randomized that way and upside down, right? But then you take it, and that worked in Karnataka. Now we're going to take it to Mumbai. That's external validity. Did what works there work here? Well, if it's the law of gravity, yes, right? If it's the effect of a measles shot, perhaps. But if it's a complicated social organization and a complicated policy with a lot of moving parts and a lot of politics and a lot of leadership, and maybe not. So there's a mismatch sometimes between the style and the scope of the policy analysis and what the decision maker needs. Other thoughts? Yes. Sometimes this policy does not really match with the real with the reality, what's really in the ground. Mm -hmm. So these policies are based on the studies and theories, but uh, the practical life is much more different. Okay, any, do we have any policy makers in here? I know we have some, the head of Interpol is here today, I know. Do you see any mismatch between the research you get and the decisions you have to make? Uh, usually it's lack of political will. Lack of political will. Oh, okay. So they have the answers, but the politicians say, look, I've got another thing I've got to do. 
if you don't mind. In fact, one study said the only example they could find of somebody using an evaluation was when they wanted to kill a program the policymaker already had decided to kill. I've got the study. It shows it doesn't work, right? As if the study made a difference. Any other thoughts? Well, here's one thought for you. You've probably heard of Henry Kissinger. And before he became the national security advisor that opened up China and the US relationships, and then a very noted Secretary of State, and now a policy advisor who whispers advice in the ears of companies and leaders around the world. Before that, he was an eminent professor. And he wrote a book in 1960 called The Necessity, a Necessity for Choice about US foreign policy. And he has a chapter in there which still makes good reading about the scholar and the policymaker. And Kissinger says, whoops, he says that there's basically a big uh, personality difference. The quest for certainty essential for scholarly analysis may be paralyzing when pushed to extremes with respect to policy. The result can be a tendency to recoil before the act of choosing among alternatives. Recoil, the policy of a scholar, I have to choose? No, I don't, I, what, which is inseparable from policymaker. And to ignore this tragic aspect of all policymaking, which lies precisely in its unavoidable component of conjecture. Be a nice title for a paper. The unavoidable component of conjecture. And if you're a person who likes certainty, you don't like that very much. There can come about a temptation by the, policy, by the scholar to delay commitment until, quote, all the facts are in, until, that is, the future has been reduced to an aspect of the past. There's a book by a couple of sociologists about, uh, it's called Why Sociology Does Not Apply. <laughs> they argue that when sociologists did analyze policy issues and propose solutions, the results were, quote, politically unrealistic, administratively unworkable, or simply impractical. <laughs> but economists, I know we tend to look down on sociologists, listen to this, John McMillan in the Journal of Economic Literature a few years back, I guess actually it was a Papers and Proceedings, tried to look at all the examples of microeconomics making a real difference to real policies. He looked, and he looked, and he looked, and he found the sale of broadband spectra. Clever. But he looked some more, and there weren't a lot more. And John concluded, theory is not always usable. You can quote that. The outstanding policy success of theory, the sale of spectrum rights, is a special case. Sometimes the extrapolation from simple theory to complex reality is just too big. Okay. This isn't by a critic of economics. This is by a distinguished econo economist who was the editor of the Journal of Economic Literature. Even when people get to the point where they are professional evaluators, and they're supposed to be doing it better than just being an academic, right? They're actually doing this stuff for a living. Here's what happens to them. Just last year, a review was done of 20 years of evaluations from 1990 to 2009. And here's the conclusion. It makes you cry. Very little empirical evidence exists to buttress the numerous theoretical postulations, bust, buttress your postulations, okay, make sure you do that. Buttress your postulations and prescriptions put forth by most evaluators. And yet for years, evaluation scholars have urged the evaluation community to carry out empirical studies, to scrutinize such assumptions, and to test specific hypotheses about evaluation practice. But they didn't do it. So we need to do better. You need to do better. We're going to hope you do better than our generation did. You guys go out there and do this stuff where you take seriously the real problem. Make sure there's not that stylistic gap. Make sure you understand what the policymaker needs. Right? Make sure you take account of political reality. Make sure you work for a policymaker who has political will. Do you have a test for that, by the way? Not, not yet. So let's take a look and see if, if you know of any examples yourselves. Let me ask particularly those who have done it or have been there in government. Do you know of any examples of successful policy research that you can talk to us about briefly? 
was a flood of hands. That many. Yes? The organization I used to work for in Sri Lanka, Indonesia, um, it was, uh, we did this study to look at um, how mobiles could, uh, how low-income earners could use mobiles and the potential that it had for poverty alleviation and all of that. Mm -hmm. And there's a proposed tax um, that they wanted to implement that was a regressive tax to negatively affect low-income earners. So we used our research to show how that would um, actually like prevent um, the low-income earners from, you know, uh, making more use of mobiles and finally adding more revenue to the government. And that kind of, uh, it prevented it to a certain extent from mm -hmm. So a simple economic analysis showed that it had regressive Tendencies. Yeah, you see lots of studies like that where you can see a rather simple effect that the policymaker may need to know or may tend to forget about. Well, last month in Mexico, they had a conference that was um, about the use of evaluations and what they call impact evaluation, from evidence to impact, it's called. And they cited three examples. First, in, this is a, a conference called From Evidence to Impact. It's a good title. From evidence, not just having a bunch of evidence, but evidence to impact. They said, what are some examples? Well, in Kenya, a study showed that deworming is a cost-effective way to increase educational participation of children. Okay. A program called Read India helped ch children read, and so it was expanded. In Mexico, a study showed that replacing dirt floors with concrete floors reduced diarrhea by a half and anemia by 80%, leading to greater school achievement. That's a pretty sizable effect. And then they started using more paved floors. But that's it. That's three. Those are not the three most pressing issues in development. Okay, they're important, but those are not the frontier issues in development, as opposed to, say, what I was going to show you here a couple of tapes. I'll just show you one. There's a thing called the Copenhagen Consensus. Have you heard about this? Two books have been published, 2004 and 2009. Here's the idea. You get together and foster studies of big issues of the quality of, say, a National Science Foundation review. So for example, uh, cleaner stoves for cooking, or vitamin supplements, or HIV uh, treatments, or climate change mitigation, or take a whole bunch of these issues, and they did 20 of them, 20 of these. They have commentators, so it's a big enterprise. And they have a meeting where they have a whole bunch of Nobel Prize winners, maybe eight experts. And these studies, by the way, are all from the perspective of benefit-cost analysis. So if you have these stoves, what are the benefits and what are the costs? If you have a program of ch children's education, what are the benefits and what are the, et cetera, of girls' education? And then these economists listen to the presentations, ask questions, and almost like a Supreme Court went off and ranked in, 19, in 2004 the 24 different uh, proposals and in 2009 the 20. And in, two, in 2004 the winner was uh, ret antiretrovirals for AIDS. And therefore a whole lot more money went into that area. It had a real impact. In 2009, by the way, the crucial one was vitamin supplements, vitamin A, vitamin D, things like this, very cheap, very effective. In both cases, these guys got a lot of heat because climate change in the sense of carbon taxes was number 23 out of 24 and number 19 out of 20 in terms of what actual effect it would have on the poor. The question they asked was, if you had $75 billion more to spend to help the poor, what's the best way to do that? If we have this thing working, I'll show you a quick tape here. If someone knows how to do this, one of our tech people, thank you. Could you show this one? It'll just take two or three minutes, but I think you'll get an idea of what they did. This is Bjorn Lomborg, who runs the Copenhagen Consensus. He's a, this is the Copenhagen Business School. The Copenhagen Consensus is based on a strong belief that knowledge matters, that research and information can be used in practical decision making.
to me as an economist, uh, I find it um, unfortunate that so many people don't think in economic terms. And I think that economics has to be you know, a substantial part of uh, good decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I wouldn't trust an economist to have any fruit and I can throw them. <laughs> but uh, if you've got to trust somebody, we've at least spent a lot of time thinking about the issues. <laughs> well, I know, but you, you said it, I didn't play it. Yeah, but Fundamental assumption underlying uh, the consensus exercise is that you can't have everything. Now, if you go to the Millennium Development Goals of the UN, it's everything, you know. I don't know where those numbers also came from. I think this is a very important exercise because it is telling you how to think more concretely about different problems, different possibilities, and how we assess their importance if you had a limited budget. Some people will say, uh, well, we have to solve all the problems. But if you have scarce resources, you can't solve them. So you can't solve all. So you have to prioritize them. You rank them, and we rank them according to the rates of return, which is the most efficient way of doing it. We're, of course, very interested in uh, getting the most mileage out of the money that would, would hypothetically be spent. And they were asking, uh, you know, what the kind of the long-term economic benefits are. Uh, yes. Um, I think uh, the Copenhagen Consensus Center is very good at creating visibility. And the hope is that many people, especially, I would say, politicians, will pay attention and that the outcome will affect uh, what they do in the future. In 2004, the Copenhagen Consensus Expert Panel assigned the highest priority to new measures to prevent the spread of HIV AIDS. This led the Danish government to increase the amount spent on activities to combat HIV AIDS. I would hope that it would draw attention of governments around the world to the issues and to the things that we think are clearly things that would improve the well-being of societies and their countries. And so if we succeed at all in doing that, I think we've done a good job. Okay, we can get this back to where it was then. The second example I was going to show you doesn't have a good video, so I'll just tell you briefly about it. In uh, 2000 or 2001, James Heckman, the Nobel Prize winning economist from Chicago, decided he would dedicate the resources of his team and himself to figuring out the answer to the following question. To help poor children, where is the best place to intervene? Is it preschool, primary school, junior high school, high school, or somewhere after that? And he's ruthless in his benefit cost thinking. For example, about lowering the class size to improve education, he said it has a slight effect, but it's not worth it. You might as well give the kids the money. So he's not politically correct. But his answer was remarkable. The answer was that it was preschool, <coughs> but not through the usual channels we'd studied it, not through increasing cognitive performance, but in changing habits of mind like tenacity, persistence, social, sociability, and so forth, which led over a long period of time to lower crime rates, lower delinquency rates, lower uh, out of wedlock births, uh, more uh, and more successful employment. A remarkable effort. And now he's putting out, I was going to show you some propaganda he's got out that's quite nice. You can look it up on the Heckman equation. And a little bit like our friends from the Copenhagen Consensus, they have a recommendation, but how to do it? And who's supposed to do what? Where's the policy analysis is not there. So we would have to help them go that last 10 yards toward the end zone. So. A few years ago, I studied some successful policy analyses at the RAND Corporation, 15 to 20, examples of high-impact policy research. 
using seven international partners, some of the leading think tanks and universities around the world, we found seven examples that they touted as highly successful, and my own humble experience doing this sort of thing. And I've come up with some findings I'd just like to share with you briefly. First, the successful studies, almost none of them involve that dominant metaphor of the policymaker making the choice with the evidence. Even though they provided evidence and they analyzed the problem, that wasn't the way that successful change took place. So our paradigm that we teach you and use ourselves, that dominant evidence-based decision making, was not it. Instead, the policy analysis helped in other ways. I would say more exciting ways. It helped people redefine what the problem was, reconceptualize the issue in a constructive way. It clarified and sometimes enhanced what the objectives were. It expanded sometimes or cut off or enriched the set of objectives and alternatives so the choices were actually larger than you thought. It helped people get together and talk. So it wasn't just one decision maker. There were many stakeholders or actors who had to work together somehow to make better outcomes happen. And the policy analysis enabled them to get together and work on hard problems in creative ways. And finally, the analysis helped create, through a process, longer-term relationships that were constructive among the actors who had to make a difference. So what it led to was not the decision among well-specified alternatives by the decision maker, but a process of creative problem solving by a group of people abetted by high quality research. Let me give you a few other examples which I think tell the same story. This is Clayton Christensen from a piece of his in the Harvard Business Review last year. He described going to visit Andy Grove, who's the head of Intel, and Grove wanted him to apply his Christensen's theory of disruptive change to micro uh, chips. And he wanted uh, Christensen to tell him what to do. And Christensen didn't do it. Instead, he said, well, you know, just like always, he said later, I don't give direct advice. What I do is I run the question aloud through one of my models. He's got these frameworks and models and theories that have been built up from experience and tested. He runs it through there, and then he picks out a good example and shows the decision maker from Intel, here's the model, and let me show you how it worked over here, in a different place, in a different industry, a different problem. And suddenly Grove goes, I get it, and he makes a decision that our friend Clayton Christensen wouldn't have known how to make because it was too contextual. But notice what he did was he brought in something which was a framework, a model, theory, whatever, and an example. Oftentimes, it's a successful example, obviously, something that worked, so that it inspires the person to think differently about the problem than he would have otherwise, and he makes the right choice. Here's a second example where it goes beyond the decision maker. This is Laura, Suns Lus Laura Suskind, who is the author of this consensus building handbook, which is about 10 years old. But two months ago, Suskind described a very interesting process I want to share with you which is now going beyond the idea there's one decision maker here. Okay? He describes a problem of getting energy efficient buildings in Charlotte, North Carolina. So they've got government uh, people, they've got the Duke Power Corporation, they've got a bunch of people who run commercial real estate projects, and they've got a bunch of citizens who care about efficient energy. And they come together after doing a bunch of work before they came. Before they came, they had uh, learned as much as they could about behavioral strategies for encouraging support for and implementation of energy efficiency measures in commercial buildings. Sounds a little boring, but check it out. It's pretty good. They did background papers and reports beforehand. And part of the day, the first day, was spent listening to well-known national researchers who shared relevant national findings. So these guys had studied up. And then they worked before Suskind showed up. By the time I arrived in the afternoon, he says, the crowd had spent many hours in breakout groups, about 40 people, so there's eight, eight tables of five, or five, I guess it was five tables of eight. 
how can the interests of building owners and facility managers be realigned to ensure they have an incentive to promote energy efficiency? We took about 40 minutes to review the many ideas from each of the tables before, eight, eight tables, sorry. I asked someone who favored each idea to explain it in two minutes. Then I asked everyone to use their cell phones to text message the choice of the proposal they supported most strongly. There were about 10 proposals. And you texted which one you like. And suddenly on the board here is a bar chart. It says what it was. A bar graph instantly revealed the popularity of each idea. I then took the top vote getters after the top four. The top four it kind of fell off. So I took the top four and said, OK, now choose two. And they did. And one got 70%. Two others got about a quarter. And he asked whether any would, would be unable to support the list of the three as the whole group's recommendation. And they pulled it together. He said he liked the technology. That's why he was writing this blog. I like the mixture of the face-to-face -face and the cell phone voting. I'm going to do this some more. But he also noted, it, you know, it's also true that it was on the heels of having uh, internationally technically sophisticated discussion leaders and recorders, highly studied participants who had data, models, and examples before they even came. And then they could coalesce different interests, different perspectives, different knowledge to produce a consensus. That's what this guy does for a living. It's a great example of something different from the decision by the decision maker with uh, evidence. It's not evidence free, though. It's still got policy analysis in there, but it's in a different method. And it's more than the choice. I'm very impressed by a process that a guy named Donald Berwick, Berwick developed, and I've copied this myself. There, Berwick was one of the pioneers of measuring the quality of healthcare in the United States, meaning not just counting up how much things cost, but what was the quality of the care as measured by what other experts said, i.e. other doctors, by what the patient's reaction to the care was in the short run and the medium run, and what the longer term health outcomes were for the patient. Each of those threes has shortcomings, but when they combine them together, you get something that's pretty interesting. And then healthcare systems wanted to adapt this new technique. So he would say, OK, send your four top people who are going to be implementing this, and we're going to do a two-day workshop with you, hands-on, with people from other healthcare systems. So you'd have five or six healthcare systems there. So you'd have your peers, you'd have your, and they'd come there, and it was all hands-on with, again, you know, the best of the theories and frameworks they had, examples for you to look at of successful implementation somewhere else, lots of data about what kinds of measures there were, what was around, and a lot of practical instruction. These guys did not take a lot of theoretical lectures. This was all very hands-on. And then, after they left, this is the part I really like, too. After they left, oh, by the way, right before they left, so the night before, the groups go off and say, what are you going to do when you get back? What's your plan for the next nine months? And the next day, they came back, and you presented your plan to the group, and everybody made suggestions. And you made some revisions. Everybody presented their plans. Everybody heard everybody else. Then they went home. For the next two weeks, the professors had the phones open. So if you forgot, let's see, what's quality again? You could call up. No problem. You had to commit to come back in nine months for convening number two. In other words, if you were going to come to number one, you had to promise you're going to come to number two. And your team came back. And the first thing is you did say, what happened? How would you guys do? Man, well, this worked well. This didn't work. These guys say, what worked for us? This, actually, we did it this way. That worked. You go, really? Oh. Everybody starts sharing their stories about what worked and what didn't work with the professors there to provide additional examples, data, and frameworks for understanding. And then before they left, once again, they said, what are you going to do when you go back? And they presented version 2.0 of their strategies to each other. The result, tremendous success in advancing their understanding in a creative way. They came up with solutions that the professors could not have done. So these examples, plus the lessons that I've learned from studying these examples of successful policy analysis, lead me to what I will call incipient hypotheses. First, as policy analysts, we can provide examples of successful things, frameworks that seem to us as professionals to summarize what social science and modeling say about what works and data to what I will call convenings, where we get the many actors together who have to be involved in a way that enables them to creatively address the issues and then to follow up 
not to let it just go to waste with a one-off event, but follow up with flows of quality information and some sort of networking enterprise. This is my hypothesis. Now, if I'm right about this, this leads me to think about something that is policy analysis 2.0, thus speaking truth to power 2.0. I do not disdain 1.0. I think there are many cases where 1.0 is a very useful device for organizing knowledge. I do think that it's too simple for most real policy issues, especially big ones. So let's contrast policy analysis version 1.0 with 2.0. 1.0 has the decision maker with the choice, and the choice is well defined. The objectives are known, the alternatives are specified, the data are good, the models are known. And your job as the analyst is to put it all together and say, is it A, B, or C, or D? What do you like? Choose B. OK, that's your recommendation. And your, mo your output is the report. So the evidence you provide is that analysis of the alternatives, and then you give a report. And you hope it doesn't get cobwebs. Now what about 2.0? What's the contrast? First of all, instead of one decision maker, there are many. Call them stakeholders, call them actors, call them public, private, nonprofit, collaboration, call it what you will. But there are many folks who are involved in making things go forward. And I ask you to think of any big policy issue you know, improving health care, improving education, improving roadways, improving ports. And you'll find there are public, private, and nonprofit actors may be important in mobilizing demand and integrating supply and getting the resources you need to do things. What about the choice? Well, that's represented now by many choices by different people. The objectives are differing and often unclear. The alternatives they have are unspecified right now. They don't quite know all the alternatives. And there's not good data or good models for very complicated problems like this. And instead of just needing the evidence, people need to help them make better decisions. They need models and theories. They need examples. And they need data that will help them be creative. It's not that you come in and say, here's what you should do, and they do it. It's not like a doctor-patient relationship in the old-fashioned sense. You've got this problem with your gastric system. Take this medicine. And finally, it's not just the report. Now the outcome of our work goes beyond our writing something down or giving a briefing. It is something like a convening, something like an event, and a follow-up. And so look at the characteristics then of policy analysis version 2.0, hypothesis. If we can do more things like this, our research, our evidence-based decision-making will grow. We will see people make better decisions, not just because they weighed and balanced A, B, and C, but because they became more creative with our creative help. Well, this suggests then, what, so what do we do with this? Well, first of all, we need to know more about this. This is a, an idea which, if not new, because I can tell you antecedents to this idea go back in literatures. I can show you antecedents in education and in psychotherapy. It's the same idea between 1.0 in the sense of take the medicine, take the knowledge, to something that's much more engaging of you and helping you be creative with your problems. But we're going to have to figure out what kinds of information for what kinds of issues and choices for what kinds of participants in what ways? For example, peasants in Haiti, what do they need to help them do better? What kinds of ways do you get that information to them? And with what results? That matrix of inputs and outputs, should we just wait till the end, then you can, please, Jonathan. That matrix of inputs and outputs, just we don't have that well understood right now. It's not that it's not knowable. It's partly because the people who now do convenings and workshops and consensus building and so forth have a little different personality type than the model builders, statistical analysts, randomized controlled trials, data hawks, which you guys all are. Right? And so there's a, these guys kind of disdain. Even the idea of evidence is kind of, eh, what's evidence? I told you it worked. That's all I need to say. But I believe that in 10 years, we'll know a lot more about this. And the reason I'm giving you this talk is because I hope that you will be actively involved in making it happen. 
Let me talk about four kinds of possible implications, if I'm right. First, for the school. The mission of the school should be broadened to include convening on important issues. It's not just doing the research and publishing the journal article or the policy brief or the teaching case, as important as those are. It is somehow seeing it as part of your mission to stimulate the creative work of public, private, and nonprofit actors that are involved in the major issues you're working on. Now, what do you need to do that? What kind of skills do you need? Well, you're going to need several things that are not obvious here. First, you need your faculty and students researching big issues. Now, you guys do well at that. Many universities do not. Everybody gets down to very narrow issues, very narrow gauge that they can get published in their disciplinary journal. And they don't want to engage with big issues. But that means that all of us have to say, well, what can we do? Are there three or four big issues we can really work on so that we can provide that set of examples, frameworks, and data that would really stimulate something important to happen? We need credibility. Our research cannot be seen as biased. Some institutions disqualify themselves from convening roles because they're ideologically known to be on the right or the left or the north or the south. You need facilitation skills. That's a set of skills that most of us don't have. It's not something we've been taught to do. So we need to develop that. Plus, we need a good venue for that. Venues are important, and we need, of course, resources for that. I've got a hypothesis for you. If we do this, people will give us lots of money. This is a big deal. Okay. And then secondly, a question for the school is, um, if I'm right, how should we teach policy analysis? Do we have to, yes, teach policy analysis 1.0 with the model building, econometrics, economics, all those things? Is there more? Do we have to think more about who exactly are those actors? What exactly is the question again? How can we turn this thing upside down and make it look different from what everybody else says it is? Second set of implications for Singapore. Now, I'm the first to say that I don't know much about Singapore. So I'm waiting for the audience to correct me. But it seems to me this is a fairly exciting time for your politics. Seems to me. You've got some things happening here that are good. And now the question is, what does that mean for engaging the big issues facing Singapore? Speaking truth to power in one kind of government with one kind of focus and one kind of monopoly may mean one thing. In a multi-ethnic, multi-party, multi-age group, multi-you-know-what, maybe we need to think, what can we do to engage those multiple interests in thinking through together some of the big issues facing Singapore? And this means asking questions such as, for this issue X, are there examples we know from other countries that might be interesting? Have we studied that? Many people who work on Singapore don't do much of that. They stay inside, look at that. Let's go out and see if we can find some other things. What theoretical frameworks might be most useful to bring to bear for these multiple groups to look at a problem? And finally, what data might be important for people to seep in data? I love them to be loaded with data so it's all around them. How about your own research? Now, here I'm particularly talking to the students, but professors, if you want to take note also, I wouldn't be offended. Never want to tell professors what to do. How do you think about your research, students? Do you think of it as t speaking truth to power? Do you think of it primarily in a critical mode? Government doesn't know what it's doing. It should be doing this. Get the capitalist dogs off of here, whatever. How to do that? That's not important. We've got to change the system. We've got to change the mindset, get the rascals out of here. That's one sort of attitude. Another one is more constructive where you say, OK, I want to try to figure out how to make this work better. Is that how you think of what you're doing? Or could you think about what you're doing? How can I use my work to enable creative problem solving by people who know a lot about this, different people, getting them together to think about it in a different way? Could that be part of what you do? Therefore, what additional questions should you pose of your research? Okay, here, are, here are five questions I'd like you to put at the end of every paper you write. Okay, first of all, how can my research help people redefine the problem? 
you might write a very narrow proposal or something or analysis of something because you're told to do so by your professor. Do this too. Secondly, what have I learned about the objectives and where do I think the objectives people are talking about are just too narrow or too vague? Third, what about the alternatives? Do I see somewhere else where there's another alternative here that people are overlooking? How could I bring that to, into the discussion? Are there ways I could imagine my research engaging multiple audiences? Could I imagine not just writing the paper, but writing the op-ed, creating the training exercise for the Haitian peasants, imagining a community-based discussion or drama? You know, you could imagine all kinds of ways to make your research matter. And finally, are there ways with the people I've seen that are working on this, are there ways I could imagine building relationships over time to enable a better dialogue about what the issues really are? I've got one final one for you, which is a little more speculative, but I think it's so important for Singapore and for other countries as well. This is what has been called the design economy. And the idea is that the world's economy has actually gone through stages. Uh, the drivers of the economies 300 years ago were agriculture. Then we moved through the Industrial Revolution. Uh, 30 years ago, the service economies were just ascendant. Recently, we've seen the information revolution, which has played such a big role in many economies. And many people see the next stage as the design economy. Here's a picture my daughter took last night at One Fullerton. If you haven't been down there, those of you who were partying hard last night, if you staggered down into One Fullerton and looked to the right, this is what you saw. What a beautiful design to me. That's a spectacular design. Daniel Pink wrote a book a few years back called A Whole New Mind. And he said the design economy is going to emphasize not just the quantitative, linear, logical side of your mind, but also the playful, aesthetic, uh, emotional side of your mind. And here are six distinctions he drew between the more linear information economy and the more artistic design economy. He said that the design economy will be characterized by high concept and high experience. What you decide to eat, what car you decide to buy, what graduate school you decide to attend, what you decide to wear, what you do with the 10% of world GDP that is tourism, will depend on the experience, how it feels to be inside the car. What does it state about you and what do you state about it when you experience that? And people are designing stores with this in mind. How does it feel to be inside a store? And this means, according to this author, that the new MBA will be the MFA, the Master of Fine Arts. Okay. He also says that there will be new benefits to diversity. And some of the things that plague a linear, straightforward society about inequalities that are more or less vertical in, say, conceptual ability or spatial ability, suddenly when it comes to design, become much more like different flavors and different colors and different sensations, different experiences, and different concepts. And therefore, the idea of mosaics of culture become exciting as destinations for design. If you think about uh, everything from designing games to furniture to um, movies to clothing to entertainment, you can ab appreciate the desirability of having places where you can go and get a variety of different things, but also you will also see fusions of things that are surprising. If you go to Bali, you see the most amazing fusions of traditional Balinese design with European design, making fabulous new things happen. Now, if this is right, then we will see organizations such as governments have new kinds of goals in terms of creating space for creativity. And this is an interesting task, isn't it? How do you recruit? How do you create incentives? How do you open things up? I think Singapore is en route, by the way. I think Singapore gets it. And they're trying to make this a much more fun place, a much more creative place. At this university, I don't know if you guys got the message today about, what is it, dance night? Did you, all, all you students who were pulling me out in the dance floor last night? You see there's a, there's a dance, there's dance and nothing else. So you're just gonna go over there and dance. If you like to dance, you go there. So yeah, you're gonna do it? Ed's gonna be there. Okay, Ed's, <laughs> Ed's gonna be good. Ed, I'm glad you're there. But all this will need will require, I think, some new thinking about policy analysis. How do we set ourselves up in a more creative mode and not so much what Clifford Gertz once derided as size up and solve social science? 
Now let me leave you with some final questions, and then I'm going to ask for your thoughts. Have you been as impressed as I have by the last three years by the amount of violent and surprising change that has gone on in the world? Just two examples. If you would have asked me a few years ago, would financial integration and trade integration reduce, reduce risk or increase risk? I would have said clearly reduces it. It's like a portfolio. You're spreading risk across many countries and many places. And it turned out we had a big systems risk problem. As soon as, in fact, one big sector went in trouble, a lot of other sectors did too. And we saw contagion effects, except for some places it escaped. But it was a worldwide issue started by something that just, it just didn't look probable. And another one, here there are rating agencies with derivatives, which are again designed to spread risks. Rating agencies to tell you what's in there. It's got three parts of chili, two parts of parsimon, blah, 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 blah. That's the mix. And it turns out it got so complicated, people couldn't understand what the product was. And they couldn't fire the guys who did it because they're the only ones who understood what's in there. You get to the point where the head of Enron gets up there and tries and almost gets off his uh, trial because he says, it's so complicated, you can't expect a CEO to understand it. Only my CFO understands that. What? And what about the Arab Spring? Who could have predicted Tunisia and Egypt, not to mention Libya and Syria? And who knows who else? An uprising, not by a, necessarily by a revolutionary force that's coming in saying, we are from this part of town and we don't like it, but through social networking, leaderless revolutions sort of come up out of nowhere. What? Completely bizarre changes are going on in the world. And we can add more. We can add social, political, technological, uh, trade, environmental changes that are going on right now that are spectacular, just spectacular. And they're making such a huge difference in the way we should think about our alternatives in dealing with major social issues. I don't think the policy community has assimilated these changes and said, what difference does this make to the way we think about transportation or health or anti-corruption or whatever your issue is that you care about? And from the point of view of evidence-based decision making, if things are changing rather rapidly and there's substantial changes, some of the evidence of the past may be about as useful as the thing I saw an article recently about you know, how Egypt's economy was so open and innovative. You know, that, may, that evidence may not be so interesting. Or a textbook published on the Soviet Union right after 1989 might not have been a very interesting textbook to have. And so what does this mean? This is the question I'm really interested in having your impression. If I'm right about these big changes and they create perhaps different kinds of need for evidence and different kinds of need for all of us to engage with changes that are not obvious. We can feel them, but we don't really understand them very well. How can policy analysis, how come the work that you and I do enable a better dialogue with the future? Okay, let me stop there and take your questions and comments. Thank you. Welcome. The floor is open. Um, could I ask uh, that you move to the microphone so that we can capture it uh, on the video and that you introduce yourself brief briefly? Jonathan? Hi, my name is Jonathan. Um, I'm on faculty at this public policy school, and I know <laughs> precious little about public policy. Uh, sorry about that. I'm a psychologist. That may be a good thing. Actually. I think so. <laughs> um, it sounds like what you're saying is there should, while there was more of a distinction between, say, the politician and the researcher, that now the, the decision maker or makers should be the negotiators, the researchers, that it should be much more integrated than it was before, that role. Yes. How viable is that? And does this work? Do we have evidence, given that we're talking about evidence, that this actually does mm -hmm. create more effective outcome? Yes, there, there is a lot of evidence around, but how it does it, and whether or not there aren't a lot of failures also, in this sort of activity. The literatures come from areas like consensus building literature, conflict resolution literature, negotiation literature, all substantial bodies. Um, I've been scouring these for hard evidence about if you do this with these kinds of people for these kinds of purposes, what happens? And as I've mentioned somewhat parenthetically as a psychologist, I think you'd appreciate this, I find the people who are doing that are a little bit impatient with that kind of 
uh, analytical or evaluative question. They just say, look, I'm going on, and they'll come up with a book full of recommendations. Do this, do this, do this. And you ask them gently, what's your evidence for that? We've seen it work. And so there's a, there's a, large, there's a large literature, but there's not a very good analytical or evaluative literature on this. So as I understand what you're saying, um, you've looked at what seems to have worked uh, in practice yes. and inductively derived then what are the characteristics of, uh, of those processes. Yes. But where we need to go is what is fine-tuning that understanding. Very much fine-tuning. Yeah, mine what is just a very when. gross level uh, proposition. Mm -hmm. And there's a few corollaries to it, Jonathan, one of which is for very complicated issues where there's clearly multiple stakeholders and lots of uncertainty, and when there's lots of political and social and technological change going on, clearly the old way we do business is incomplete. And so this new way is possible, but I, I can't say that I have a, a good recipe on it yet. So it sounds like the two key skills might be uh, a high tolerance for ambiguity and skills in facilitation. The, the difference between the pure tea group or uh, brainstorming session sort of thing. And what I'm talking about is, I'm talking about policy analysis playing a role in here. I'm talking about the thing that Clay Christensen said when he said, I brought them my models and I brought them my examples from his research that helped these guys go, oh, I get it, okay, I'll try that. And it worked. See, so there is, I'm hoping there's room for more than just a person that gets people together. Let's talk about our values together, which is also useful. But I'm talking about something that you and I know as policy research also playing a vital role in this. Yeah. Eduardo. Hi, Bob. Uh, I'm, I'm Ed Radal, and uh, I'm also Bob's uh, dancing partner. So. <laughs> I, I, Don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> We've got lots of witness, Bob. Um, I wonder if you deliberately missed the part on institutions and the political economy of version 2.0. I say this because how can I speak truth to power when there's no rule of law for the ruling elite? I'll, I'll go to jail. How, how can I have a creative economy when there's no property rights? Hmm. So what's the role of the economy in political, or the role of institutions and in political economy in version 2.0? Mm -hmm. Well, let's take, let's take the problem of uh, rule of law, and let's look at examples where countries have been able to make substantial progress with that. Oftentimes, they were not, it was not progress that was done from the top down only with one honest person on a white horse going in there and doing something. It was often something that involved civil society and the business community working um, in concert where the business community is diagnosing corrupt systems or doing auto regulation or integrity packs and citizens are pressuring and lobbying for change and reporting things when it doesn't go well. And the government is trying to figure out how can I reform my systems to make things happen. So even in complicated areas like that, I think the prospect for reform is not policy analysis 1.0, where you just come in and say, well, what you need to do is this, 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 and this. And nobody's engaged. Nobody owns it. Nobody understands it. Nobody sees what they can do to help. And there's not the follow-up that enables a, a constellation of forces that can move forward. Now, do I have an automatic, though? Do I have, can I show that works every time? No. But I think the successful ones are more likely to have that policy analysis 2.0 feature to it. I think there's another question that ha you have in there, though, which is harder for me, which is, does your approach work if the institutions are terrible? And if you've got bad guys all over the place who don't care? Well, policy analysis 1.0 doesn't work too well either in that circumstance. So if we have really bad guys, uh, then I think we just we probably don't choose to work there. And we choose not to help that particular kind of power. Uh, I guess I'm more optimistic, though, in even some of the worst places. You've got reformers coming in in cities and ministries and presidencies in very bad countries that have the desire to make changes. And there are windows of opportunity if we can provide the right kinds of analyses through the right kind of processes to galvanize the kind of alliances it'll need for reform. Yes, please. I am uh, Zach. I'm an MPP alumnus. I, I'm interested in the consultation and consensus building part because I find that um, with 
with the 1.0 and 2.0 comparison, 1.0 would be more evidence-based, more factual, and although you would have some stakeholder analysis and consultation, they would only be a part of the equation, whereas in 2.0, if I understand correctly, um, they're a larger part of the equation. Very much so. And so my question is, when it comes to you know, stakeholder analysis and then you have FGDs and all of these other ways of gathering input, and especially when there's consultation and consensus building, you find that some people have more say than others. Uh, it might work when everyone has an equal say and everyone knows that or respects each other's opinion, but in this case, how would you, or would there be a sort of hierarchy? How would you evaluate um, this person's uh, interests over the other person's interests and come to a consensus? Right. Well, it's a very good question. The literature on these events is full of concern about how do you keep one person from taking a dominant position? How do you stop privileging particular groups of people? How do you avoid it being ransacked by experts? How do you avoid the person who convenes it not using it as a device to slam through her own agenda? So there are these dangers of hijacking, and there are many failures to this process where the very active consultation ends up being a, an opportunity for political posturing. I was talking to President Obama about this this morning. No, just kidding. Uh, this, <laughs> these processes of consultation and consensus building can be opportunities for uh, breakdown. So it's a very good question, and I hope that in the next 10 years we know a lot more about that. See, I can finesse these questions because I don't have to know the answer yet. Just, thanks. Yes, should. Please. Could I suggest you go to the microphone? My name is Wu Xin, a faculty member in the program. Um, you know that you use the, the, the kind of analogies of the software development, uh, you know, from 1.0 to 2.0. Uh, but so if we extend that analogies, uh, that software development uh, uh, will go through stages, right? So uh, the, the, my, my question is that uh, imagine countries where uh, the, the uh, policy analysis of 1.0 has not been influential, that has not uh, had much impact in the policy making at all, right? So basically we can describe as uh, close to no policy at all, right? So would you sort of uh, uh, suggest that uh, the, to, to move forward, that country should uh, uh, just leap forward directly to uh, uh, policy analysis 2.0, or that, you know, for those type of country uh, that, that the policy analysis of 1.0 uh, might actually provide necessary building block yes. uh, so that they can be more successful uh, towards uh, the uh, you know, sort of uh, future addition mm -hmm. of, uh, of policy analysis. I don't have a good answer to that, Sean. It's a great question. Um, I will tease around the edges of it for one minute, though. I'm impressed by how much interesting work right now about the small questions is coming out of places like Colombia, Mexico, India, Kenya, with something a little bit like randomized controlled trials, the conditional cash transfer program, some of the educational innovations. Uh, those countries are leading the way. In fact, places like New York City and San Francisco and Los Angeles are copying some of the ideas that have come out of Colombia and Brazil and Mexico. So uh, there is room for at the level of should we have dirt floors or cement floors, if that's an issue, and you need to hit somebody over the head with data to make that happen, which is surprising to me, but if that's something you need to do, then let's go get that kind of information and see if we can, can vend it. The harder questions that countries face when they're trying to move from a $4,000 a year per capita income to a $12,000 a year per capita income, or trying to move from a mobilizing resources to an innovative economy, or they're trying to some of the things that, you know, build up huge, um, uh, huge, uh, huge cities without creating tremendous instability in the economy. Those kinds of questions, I think, demand excellent research. They need economists and statisticians and so forth, but the policy choice is not through a paper that you're going to write about that. It's going to be through something else. Now, I, I can't say a lot more than that because I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just my, so my gut feeling is it's going to take something like a 2.0, but should it leapfrog? Are there some issues you need to build the groundwork first? I don't know. Or put it, putting it slightly differently, I was wondering, uh, do you think that version one could be, in a way, the ticket that buys you a seat at the table yes. in a somewhat more privileged way than just the man on the street Yes. Uh, to this deliberative process? So yes, I should reiterate that again. In case any of you students, first year students, about to begin your weight training and cardiovascular work and economic statistics and so forth, in case you think that I'm 
saying that's not important. You've heard me all week, right? I've been telling you how important that is. I'm a believer in that. And so I'm talking about a kind of process where you have done world-class research. Remember my example of LKY school? You've got to do that research. You've got to bridge that gap, though, between just writing the sociological treatise or the economic theory piece to really try to engage the problem. And then you're humble about it. You're bold, but you're also humble. You can't solve that problem. But you can help people bring, get them together and show them examples, show them frameworks and models, show them data. And then what's the process to do that? How do you do that? I'm playing with that in my own work. I've got some ideas about that, but I don't have much evidence about that. But I believe there's a concoction we can get that will be very effective in helping elevate discussions. And then if we can continue that with relationships that we nurture, um, I just think there's a great chance for success. But I'm hopeful. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, Raymond Kwok, representing VC.com and Oxford Economies. Um, May I ask the questions and see your version one and version two, whether what I'm trying to look at is uh, a, me a metaphor. Uh, version one, which you say is in a physics world, which is mechanic, mechanic, mechanical or engineers. Version two is more in the chemistry world, basically, uh, you know, chemical in terms of, you know, reactions, because it's uncharacterized, you put in a lot of basically uh, un feature unfixed uh, theories for the things to come out to, uh, to work and try to put it in, you mentioned something very briefly about the triple P. Basically, uh, public and private, and then the part, the, the part of it basically is the non-NGO. Most of the public policies uh, is wasted. You mentioned it started at the beginning, you say a lot of money has been basically wasted. Uh, would you say that between the two P, the private and the public, if they join together in all projects, would it be more efficient? Well, you've asked two questions. On the engineering chemistry one, I'm going to have to plead ignorance on that. I just don't know enough about either one. But I've been teaching this course on public-private nonprofit partnerships. And so I've been looking at, again, at the evidence of what works for what kinds of issues, what kinds of partnerships are there. I'm very interested in the question, what is government particularly good at? What is business particularly good at? And what are NGOs particularly good at? And so for a big policy issue where you need a lot of things to happen, what tasks can we somehow assign to each group? And then how do we mobilize the incentives and information to enable that to be reinforcing? So you, you, you actually a design part, and then there's a management part to that. So the evaluation and policy analysis part has a design element, has a lot of economics, and has a lot of statistics. And then there's a lot of evidence around. But the people who have done a lot of the studies don't quite see it the way we're talking about here. They're not asking the question I've been posing. And therefore, a lot of that literature doesn't, doesn't nourish the questions that you and I are asking here. So I, I'll just conclude by saying I think that public-private nonprofit partnerships, in the way I just described it, is a classic area where we need version 2.0, built on careful analysis. But eventually, we need to get people together and think together about what the problems are. And they're not going to go in one direction either. They're going to go all over the place. But we hope that things will move toward progress. I'd like to use the chair's prerogative to ask the last question. Uh, and that is, uh, I think there's one idea in particular that has radical implications that you've presented us with uh, today. And that is the notion that a school of public policy should be a convener in addition to doing many other things. Because I sense most schools of public policy are far from that, rea uh, from that proposition uh, and don't even begin really to do it in any kind of system, systematic way. Um, so I'd just like to ask you actually to expand a little bit mm -hmm. on that. What are your marching orders for a school that, let's say, is seven years old, situated in Asia? Where that? Somewhere like Singapore. So, uh, <laughs> somewhere like that. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are your marching orders for a school that could mm -hmm. take that idea on board uh, seriously? Because mm -hmm. I find it a very compelling idea, and yet, really structurally uh, uh, mismatched with uh, mm -hmm. the kind of KPIs and, 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 and order of business that we usually set ourselves as a school. You're, you're quite right. And yet, I think you remember last September or October, you had David Elwood come through here from the Kennedy School, who gave a talk about what we've been trying to do at Harvard to take on big issues and all the resistance, and yet this is what they do. If you look at the websites of places of leading universities, you'll find 
a lot of deans and presidents trying to push things toward taking on big issues. Uh, Stanford's a good example. Um, and then there are, are nice books about how universities fare in this effort. There's one that's called Shakespeare, Einstein, and the Bottom Line, which talks about business government partnerships, of which this university has many wonderful examples in the high tech area. I mean, this is a pioneer right, right down the street here in other parts of this campus that are just spectacular. I think of the CREATE Center there. That, that wasn't here a year ago when I was here. Now they have 1,000 researchers working on electric vehicles and who knows what else. So there are examples now of government, private, public, university partnerships from which we should be learning. Uh, you're lucky to have Professor Straussman here who's been active in this at Rockefeller University and at Syracuse, a new member of the faculty who's back in the back. And maybe we can ask him to talk about this. Uh, after I leave, Jeff, you can give a talk on this, uh, please, to correct my errors and give examples. Nonetheless, coming back to Scott's point, it is true that you have to have a strategy for doing something that's different because the centrifugal forces are students want to do their PAEs on something that's feasible and they can get done. Professors would like to write their papers for the Journal of Economic Literature and the American Sociological Review and the Asian Journal of Public Management. And everybody's got their funding sources and their little things they're doing. And so saying to people, could we imagine working on a big problem or two that would, where a convening role is important that's a little bit of a stretch until you say, well, look at the water center, right? Look at some of the things that are already going on here. And I guess I would try to pick the lowest hanging fruit I could. Find some people that are already working in these areas, get a little more incentive to do it, tie it in with some of the university initiatives and see if we can find one thing that we could push forward as an example. Professor Clickard, <laughs> thank you very Professor much Fritzer, for uh, you. spending the time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.